Hello, welcome back to Chig Notes for episode 7. Um, to jump into the synopsis, um, so for this week's chapters, they really focused on Ned's and the other Navajos recruits, um, their experiences in boot camp. Um, they take the uncomfortable journey back through some of the areas that were part of their ancestors' long walk and wind up at their basic training site. Here, the Navajo recruits excel at just about everything except for swimming, where Ned sank to the bottom and others um, sort of struggled to escape the pool. Eventually, the recruits are moved along to Camp Elliot, where they are surprised to find out um, that they're becoming code talkers. Um, so two Navajo teachers are tasked with teaching them all this secret code based on their language and the English alphabet. And uh, before the chapters end, we see that Ned is actually shipped out to Pearl Harbor. Um, he gets there safely and hopefully soon we'll get to see sort of what Ned does with this new code that he's learned and what the other recruits do as well. So that pretty much sums up these chapters and we can jump into the discussion questions. Okay, so for this question, which was, there were moments where Ned felt comforted or fearful based on his cultural teachings and beliefs. What aspects of Navajo culture slash beliefs advantage and or disadvantage them in the war? What role does diversity serve in other contexts beyond war? Um, so firstly, we discussed some of the more obvious physical advantages and disadvantages that presented themselves due to Ned's culture. Um, it was said by one participant that it seemed as though his aversion to water um, was a disadvantage since he could not swim at all initially. Um, he basically almost washed out because of it, he had mentioned. But all the other physical aspects about the Navajo recruits um, lent themselves as advantages, it seemed, since they excelled in so many other ways. Um, while we were on this note, we ended up talking about how we were all really interested to learn about the cultural relationship with water that the Navajo have, um, as it seemed to be a bit more of a cautious one, a bit of a fearful one, um, whereas many other First Nations cultures that we were all familiar with in the group um, have this sort of deeper bond with water and sort of like connect to it and love it. Um, then we mentioned the beliefs um, surrounding dead bodies, felt as if it would be uh, a disadvantage for them in this war setting specifically, and Ned sort of alluded to that in the text as well. Um, we did note that the cultural worldview of community and collectivism would probably benefit the Navajo lively and be an advantage, um, since they felt so passionately about protecting their families, their communities, their lands, their future generations. Um, so perhaps that collectivistic culture allowed them to a bit more fearlessly enter battle. Um, the group agreed that it seems as though their sort of unfortunate experiences in boarding school actually helped them in this particular setting, um, in the sense that they were so used to being mistreated, um, you know, eating bad quality food or no food at all, potentially, um, and sleeping in like uncomfortable beds, that some of these things that were really breaking the non-Indigenous recruits were actually not bothering the Navajos. Um, you know, these cots and meals were far better than what they had been used to in the schools. Um, on the flip side of this, then, um, the group discussed how potentially these traumas from boarding school could disadvantage some Navajo Marines, since their baseline for trauma is now much higher than potentially some of the non-Indigenous recruits who hadn't experienced that stuff. Um, and so perhaps their tipping points can be reached much quicker, um, which could definitely happen in a war setting for sure. Um, you know, maybe some of the treatment or situations in war will trigger that, um, so that will disadvantage them. So something that uh, we'll potentially see or hear about um, going forward in the book, so we're interested in keeping an eye on that situation for sure. From there, we moved on to sort of the other part of the question here and talked about diversity outside of the war context and its role. Um, some members talked about how you can create much better products and provide access to these products for diverse groups of people whenever you can have a diverse work team um, who can sort of then create these really uh, innovative and holistic solutions um, and have all these great ideas. Um, we also discussed how in a school setting as well, it's been extremely beneficial um, to a lot of students that are in this group to have diverse groups of partners for projects since it's been able to open up so many new perspectives you know you can't have all these perspectives by yourself and some things you just aren't able to experience um, based on your own culture or your own experience and then um, you just can't pull from that so it's good to have a lot of different people that can pull from their own um, lived experiences and cultural um, sort of worldviews or traditions and stuff so that's benefited in the school setting as well 
Um, and then we agreed that we thought diversity leads to respect and equality ultimately as well. And so when spaces are no longer sort of overrun um, by like white people with white privilege, which um, does tend to happen in a lot of situations, um, the playing fields sort of become more leveled and people have more equal say and opportunity. So that was one sort of uh, great benefit to diversity. Um, and diversity can, you know, really open our eyes to problems we didn't even know existed um, because we don't get to experience them. Um, and then here there was an example used for um, gender equality looking really different in the discussions and in the solutions for North Americans um, versus someone who is, for example, from Nigeria was this um, particular group member's experience in a conversation with them. So um, just that that looks really different and it's important to include all these diverse um, experiences. So um, that was something we noted as well. And then we finished off by noting that um, the importance of seeing other cultures as simply different from ours and not bad or good. Um, there is, you know, there's no culture that is the moral starting point or baseline, right? Um, and the more we can realize this, we agreed that um, the more we can really seek out diversity in our lives, which is really wonderful and uh, really good for everyone. So that was um, it for that question. And we can move on into question number two. So for question number two, we have, uh, at the end of chapter 10, Ned realizes three things. White men are not born knowing everything. Um, in many of the most important ways, white men are no different than Navajo men. And that no matter what they are, people can always learn from each other. So the question here is, do you think that Ned experienced more equality in the Marines than outside of it? Um, do you think non-Indigenous Marines or military persons um, became more appreciative and accepting of other cultures during or after the war? Um, so basically, for this one, um, like right off the bat, we all got the sense that Ned and the other Navajo recruits did experience more equality in the Marines. Um, we talked about how Ned seemed to have really um, friendly, a really friendly and positive relationship with his teachers and some of his superior officers, um, and that they really found this place to be like almost like a haven for them now. Um, even the oath being translated into Navajo was huge and very inclusive for them. Um, they also got, you know, the same beds, the same food, a lot of the other same things and treatment as the non-Indigenous recruits too. Um, we went on to discuss how surprised Ned was by his experience with some of the white colleagues and that until this moment, you know, all his interactions with white people were in school settings um, and in like a student-teacher sort of relationship. Um, you know, that was a really controlled environment for Ned, um, where the teachers could tell the Navajo students just about anything they wanted to, um, that they wanted to believe, you know, were true, um, and the children would believe a lot of it, potentially. So here, um, now in the military, Ned gets to meet and interact with non-Indigenous people and see for himself what they're like and how they relate, actually. Um, the example of his interaction with Georgia Boy came up here, and we all kind of agreed that while Reading this, we felt really on edge at first and nervous because we thought it was going to be a really bad interaction, um, kind of like how Ned was worried, it seemed as well. Um, but it turned out, of course, that uh, it was a really friendly and respect respectful interaction, um, and Ned came to many realizations through this and other experiences so far as well, um, and says that, you know, it turns out that, you know, they weren't so different after all. So um, that was a really great sort of addition to the, to the book there. Um, we moved on to talk about how, of course, in this book, we don't get to have a non-Indigenous perspective, so we were speculating really about their reactions um, to working with non-white people um, and whether or not this lends itself to sort of quashing some of their preconceived notions um, and negative stereotypes. Um, we suspected that maybe there would be more change and acceptance amongst the lower ranking officers and Marines because they had a lot more personal interactions and worked alongside the Navajo more intimately than the higher ranking officers. Um, we then talked about the issue actually um, of displacement and how it really contributes to the sort of xenophobia and racism that exists in North America because you know a lot of white people don't get the opportunity to meet or interact with or appreciate Navajo people um, and their culture because they're all on reserves in many cases and vice versa you know Navajo don't get to interact with white people often. Um, and um, so from here, we are also saying that um, it's still a contemporary issue as well. Um, it's not just, you know, happening back in, during the World War II era, of course. Um, many indigenous populations are still super isolated um, and difficult to access for, for both parties. 
you know, not many people get to fully understand their living situations and their lifestyles. Um, and, you know, some of that is desired, um, but definitely difficult to sort of see someone else's perspective whenever you don't get to experience the way that they live and like what they're fighting for and stuff. So it is definitely an issue today that we don't get enough um, interaction with other cultures, especially indigenous ones. So we talked about that. We finish off this discussion by noting that, you know, although a lot of these experiences sound like equal ones, and it sounds like, you know, the Navajo are really getting to be seen as more equal to the white men, um, but actually it was, we, we kind of noticed that it was more that the white people were being brought down to the way that the Navajo were being treated, like the white people were being treated, um, you know, less lesser than they were used to before, um, and the Navajo were being treated slightly better, but still, you know, being told they were worthless and stupid and being yelled at and sort of being like just mistreated in general. Um, so it wasn't really like they were, the Navajo were boosted up to being treated like really well, like a lot of white people were. It was more that it was almost brought down um, to a level of equality. So it was still nice that they were treated equally more, um, but it wasn't necessarily like in the, the greatest of directions for the Navajo themselves. So um, that was something we thought was important to know as well. Um, so this question was, at one point during Ned's training, Major Shannon decides that whatever a Navajo man can do, white man can do better, um, and insists that three white sons of traders are made sergeants and in charge of the code talkers. Um, they end up being brought in as privates and were almost immediately removed from this task since they were not nearly skilled enough to be um, code talkers. So the question for this is, what are some of the pros and cons to including non-Indigenous people in Indigenous ceremony and culture? What are some examples of cultural appropriation versus appreciation, both from the book and in today's real life, and how do you suspect they affect Ned and others? Um, so the first thing we discussed here was, you know, how the pros of inclusion into ceremony are and how they allow others to really get an idea of um, what those people cherish and love um, who are participating in the ceremony and how they live. Um, so there was a lot of pros discussed there, um, but there was, you know, a flip side of the situation um, being that you know, there's a possibility that due to the fact that non-Indigenous people are present in this ceremony, um, that these events and ceremonies actually start to look different. Um, they're a little bit more potentially catered to non-Indigenous people, um, but they also might be, um, just people might be a little bit self-conscious, potentially, um, about non-Indigenous presence. Um, as another example here, we discussed how, you know, one participant had been, um, in the book club had been, um, been to a traditional healer in one of their sessions, and, you know, this participant wondered how this interaction made the healer feel, um, because, you know, for the participant, they felt really educated and respectful, um, through this interaction, but perhaps the healer felt a little bit strange healing a white person when, historically and still today, you know, they've caused so much pain and trauma to the Indigenous community. Um, but another member did note here that, you know, though perhaps the healer, um, potentially they felt really proud of their ability to, you know, help heal this person, um, to be in a situation where the non-Indigenous person was more vulnerable, um, and sort of, like, able to relinquish their control, um, and that sort of, like, power, um, that they had, and, uh, and just, like, let their trust go and be with this Indigenous person. Maybe that was really, um, a moment of pride for the healer. So, you know, there's, there's two ways to look at it, and it's hard to, it's hard to know what other people are feeling. Um, but yeah, so that was sort of that element of the discussion where we started, and then we talked a bit more about appreciation versus appropriation elements, and we sort of discussed how there's so many great elements to other cultures that are important to learn, um, learn from. And since everyone holds different knowledge, you know, for example, the ecological equality that comes from many indigenous worldviews is a super great idea. Um, you know, if other cultures were to sort of embody that belief um, as well, it would be a much you know, we'd be in a much better off situation environmentally, um, ecologically, right? So there are some elements from other cultures that are definitely um, important to appreciate and to potentially sort of like include into your own life. Um, but, you know, that's different than appropriation. So we kind of started talking about this a little bit. Um, there's a lot of elements 
to other cultures that are very exclusive and closed off to others from taking it into their own lives. So we talked a bit about that. Um, and we also noted that there are a lot of elements that become appropriate and commodified, actually. Um, so like non-Indigenous people creating and selling dream catchers, for example, um, that's sort of like one example of that. Um, we moved on to talk about Ned's experience and how in the Marines this was potentially some of these men's only opportunities to interact with and participate in any sort of like um, outside of their own cultural ceremonies. Um, and so including them in these moments was really wonderful and potentially changed their minds for a long time, um, which was a huge benefit, I think. Um, so specifically, we noted the example where Ned and the others dressed more traditionally um, and did some like dancing and singing, and there's like, other Marines that joined in here. But you know, not in a mocking way, it was genuine and it was a moment of enjoyment for them all and they just participated together and had a really um, sort of great moment. Um, this felt like Ned was able to experience a lot of freedom in the Marines as well, um, compared to outside of, the, uh, outside of the Marines and sort of like the white man's world now, um, which is really strange considering um, that the military is typically very structured and, you know, um, in our heads is sort of like one of the less free areas to work in and to live in. Um, and we also mentioned on this topic that potentially their culture and language was um, more appreciated by lower ranking officers again, um, and that maybe after the war ended, some Navajo felt a bit used in the situation. Um, this is speculation, but um, at the time they felt very valued, um, but we just weren't sure. Uh, interestingly, one member noted that um, having open cultural spaces and ceremonies can allow a lot of disenfranchised and disconnected indigenous people to actually reconnect with their own culture. Um, a member noted that, you know, had these ceremonies not been open to the entire public, they would not have been able to go and learn more about themselves really since they were not, you know, card carrying or a status indigenous person. Um, so it was, you know, that open doors policy and that, that um, just cultural element of just openness and inclusion um, for anyone to join really allowed them to reconnect with themselves and then now actively participate in that community too. So that was really interesting. Um, we finished off this discussion by talking about how cultural participation and experience can really foster respect and appreciation and that many people, you know, are xenophobic or racist because they're afraid. And a really wonderful way to extinguish those feelings of fear um, is by participating in the cultures and getting to see it themselves. So, you know, it can be one of the most powerful ways to promote a more peaceful and accepting community, which is really great. Um, it's a really important step towards achieving reconciliation, we all noted, um, and in many ways so that, uh, you know, we can kind of get to where we want to be with our relationships between, um, you know, the states, uh, the, the First Nation states and the colonial states. So, um, yeah, we're really excited to continue reading for that. Um, so that concludes this week's episode of Chig Notes. Um, next week, we are going to be talking about chapters 15 to 21 inclusive. So come back again for Chig Notes episode 9. Um, and we'll see you then. Thank you, miigwech. Have a good day.